Hier nog een leuk moment, die jullie dingen zijn was er ons van eerst wel. Alle van binnen alle de verleden tussen en niet samen de organist, en ook een stand en organist is dan Mr. Robert Muth. He'll be at the organ next week and the week after. A couple of intimations about the members of the congregation. Teresa Taylor had an operation on her last week, and probably Miss Delney she's making slow but steady progress. And Archie Steele is back in hospital again, so our best wishes and prayers are with us over the, today. Uh, the big singing takes place tonight here in the church at 6.30. It's both the choirs of uh, Newt Hill and of Belsall Central, and it's an aid of the leprosy mission. So we're all invited this, this evening at 6.30 uh, for the big sin. Uh, I've got two thank you letters uh, from the organisations that we've raised money for. Christian Aid, we raised £236 uh, for them, and they've given us a thank you for that, and I'll put that on the notice board. And also the Deborah, that's the, the wee girl that was uh, on the TV. Uh, Graham Souris uh, is doing a lot of work for her and her charity, uh, Skin Disorder. So again, we raised £217 for them, and they've given us a letter of thanks. Again, I'll put that on the notice board. And uh, Drew has asked me, you know we've got 150 uh, celebrations coming off in October, uh, he's asked me, has anyone got any photographs of either the Blackie Hall or the Mans, the church, the visual church Mans here? We've got photographs of the church, but we don't have any photographs of the Mans or the, the Black Hall, Blackie Hall. Uh, if anyone has any photographs showing any bits of it, if they don't mind if they could give them to Drew whenever you get a chance. And, uh, and lastly, I've got one belated birthday. June, I believe it was your birthday on Friday, darling. <laughs> you don't look 32, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Hope you a lovely time on, on Friday, too. Thank you very much, indeed. That's all the information I have. Thank you very much, indeed, for your attention. And Ian, I look forward to you leading us in Russia.
listen to what God is saying. If we do not return to our foolish ways, let faithfulness rise from the earth, And so we worship the great Lord our God. He is a hymn of the glory of God, the Lord of all being, through the Father.
And so we seek that love among us today. We still our hearts now and we ask you to speak to each one of us. Speak in the stillness. Speak in the prayers of we to make. Speak in the reading of your word. Speak in all our praises. And now we use our Lord's great words to focus our prayers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our sins. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, where are all the wee ones this morning? <laughs> well, just so that you at least you'll know something of what we're speaking, I'll still give you the talk <laughs> we've got here. First slide that we've got. Uh, have you ever been really afraid? Yes. Next one. Maybe in a storm at night, and there have been some wild storms. I can remember when we were down in Bangor, and the <coughs> heavens opened, and you couldn't see, you were driving at the time, and you couldn't see in front of us. And we crept along in a very uh, and then the, the, the lightning came, and actually there was a gap in the, the, the side of the road we turned into a field. <coughs> and before we knew it, the next 10 minutes, there were a half a dozen other cars <laughs> alongside us. We were not the only ones who were terrified to go on. Yes, thunder, lightning, and a dark wood, or totally <coughs> lost. Uh, totally lost. Um, I can remember a time when we were at the Holy Land in a party by a senior minister who was leading the party and we arrived at the old city of Acre, Acre. And Acre is a quite a, it's an old crusader town and the streets are very narrow. There's a, a, a nice wall outside and there's the uh, Mediterranean uh, shore. Now we went to the, they told us we're going to uh, see um, some of the sites of, of uh, Acre and so I took the camera and we're down at the seashore and there was a cafe and we noticed the folk in the cafe said oh our party's there so I took some more pictures and when I came back there were folks at the cafe I didn't recognise the thing, it wasn't any of our party and the bus was gone. <laughs> Oops! <laughs> no, so I said to myself, I hope we're doing now. I heard my minister say that they were going to the lighthouse at one point. So I got my wee guy and I look and I walked along through some streets and we looked at it, but there was no bus at the light. It wasn't a little part of it because it's quite a, a, a small town. So I went back, but for some reason or other, got into some, and then this time it was afternoon, late afternoon. And of course, darkness comes in the Holy Land, not just with a, an extended period of gloaming. There's no gloaming. It's land and then it's wow. So we were getting into this narrow street. And it was getting darker and darker. And I had no idea. I was trying to work out where it was. Uh, and then I heard sirens going, the police sirens. And I said, oh, help, somebody's having a problem. And, Eventually, actually, a tongue left, and then I was just beside the shore. So I stood, and there was the bus. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and inside the bus, the minister was telling the congregation, if I get this fellow, what I'm going to do to him, I'm gonna. And then the door opened, and I walked up. And the words were, oh, Ian son, where were you? <laughs> and he put his arms around me. Yes, it was totally lost. Now, I didn't, I knew where I was. I wasn't lost at all. I knew where I was. But I didn't 
know where they are. <laughs> so there we are. Yes, things have happened. Yes, but we've got in our Bible, uh, one of the Bible stories, we've got a uh, very, well, that's just a picture, that was maybe a picture of me, uh, <laughs> a picture of in Matthew, one of the, the passages, the storm at sea. Jesus, of course, was around the lake at all times and came to uh, talk, and uh, he actually tried to get away, and when he arrived at the shore, they'd seen where he was, the boat was going and they all arrived and there was a crowd there and so Jesus had compassion he didn't say in an annoyed here I'm trying to get away from you lot compassion <laughs> and he fed them and then at the end of the day uh, he went up the hill alone and that's when the disciples were out on the lake and of course it was dark and it was wild and the wind whipped up and the waves were beating on, on the boat and it was quite stormy. <coughs> and Jesus saw this from the hill and came down and walked to see him. And they looked and what did they see? Jesus. No, it, 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 don't run on. <laughs> back to the country. They saw Jesus on the water and of course their faces say it all. They were terrified. It's a ghost. It's a ghost. Uh, and Jesus had to say, it's I, hands up, don't be afraid. How often Jesus says that to folk, don't be afraid, fear, don't be afraid, it's I. And then the next slide tells us that um, Peter says, she's Jesus, and he says, look, if it really is you, tell me to come the water to you. Well, Jesus said, Come. And so he got out and walked along uh, towards Jesus. And then, of course, he looked at the sky and he looked at the water. And what happened? There he is. <laughs> like a stone, he dropped in. Save me, save me, I'm drowning. And Jesus reached out his hand. But when they went back onto the boat, of course, all the disciples were amazed because here was a man that was more than a man. He was no less than God with them. And so fears are come. Storms are brought into the power of the Almighty One, the power of Jesus. And the same with our storms that we meet in life, of course, today. Well, no matter what storms we go through, storms of ill health, uncertainty, job loss, Job change, home change, whatever it is, uh, the Lord indeed is able to guide, calm, and lead us. And so, a very important word for the, us all as we continue. Now, the hymn that I've chosen here is Father, I place into your hands the things that I can do. And it's important that we do hand over to God. Thank you. Thank you. 
last one, Elijah. Now Elijah had a great victory in Mount Carmel, but then after that he goes away down to the south and arrives at Mount Sinai, and the story picks up. The first reading is from First Kings. Elijah walked to Mount Sinai. Suddenly the Lord spoke to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? He answered, Lord God Almighty, I have always served you, you alone, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed all your prophets. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. Go out and stand before me on top of the mountain, the Lord said to him. Then the Lord passed by and sent a furious wind that split the hills and shattered the rocks. But the Lord was not in the wind. The wind stopped blowing and then there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire there was a soft whisper of a voice. When Elijah heard it, he covered his face with his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. A voice said to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? He answered, Lord God Almighty, I have always served you, you alone. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed all your prophets. I am the only one left and they are trying to kill me. The Lord said, Return to the wilderness near Damascus, then enter the city and anoint Hazel as king of Syria. Anoint to you as son of Nimshah as king of Israel. And anoint Elijah son of Shaphat from Abel Meholah to succeed you as a prophet. Anyone who escapes being put to death by Hazel will be killed by Jehu. And anyone who escapes Jehu will be killed by Elijah. Elijah. Yet, Yet I will leave 7,000 people alive in Israel, and those who are loyal to me and have not bowed before to Baha or kissed his idol. The next reading is the call of Elisha. Elijah left and found Elisha flying with a team of oxen. There were 11 teams ahead of him, and he's flying with the last one. Elijah took off his cloak and put it on Elisha. Elisha then left his oxen, ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah answered, All right, go back. I'm not stopping you. Then Elisha went to his team of oxen, killed them and cooked the meat, using the yolk as fuel for the fire. He gave the meat to the people and they ate it. Then he went and followed Elijah as his helper. The next reading is from Matthew 14, verses 22 to 27. Jesus walks on the water. Then Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the lake, where he sent the people away. After sending the people away, he went up a hill by himself to pray. When evening came, Jesus was there alone, and by this time the boat was far out in the lake, tossed about by the waves, because the wind was blowing against him. Between three and six o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to the disciples walking on the water. When they saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and screamed with fear. Jesus spoke to them at once. Courage, he said. It is. Don't be afraid. Amen, we go to this place to these readings of his holy word. And now we sing this nice play, Hymn Together, which is My Life Flows On an Endless Song. Some of the piece uh, I'll show you how to sing.
Today we're looking into the life and the powerful minister of Elijah. Could have been a dominant force throughout the history of God's wayward people who sometimes got really corruptious and whose king at this time, King Ahab, was under the thumb of his notorious wife, Queen Jezebel. And she led them into false worship with the Baal, Baal, anyhow you say it, and Asher, eh, which were disastrous religions of eh, fertility and nature instead of the God of our nature. Well, a disastrous famine happened because of their disobedience. The gods of Baal and Asher were all and these religious practices were going against all that God had taught them but the great one God above all and here comes Elijah now we've all read the heroes of faith from some of the earliest days <coughs> Abraham, Moses, David, Isaiah, Elijah they've all a wonderful place in the teaching and the guiding of God's truth. And when we look at these, sometimes we look at our own life and we say, you know, my leadership is very poor, my life is really nothing like theirs at all. As a boy, um, I remember listening in the 60s to a radio program called Fireside Sunday School. And it was a BBC program and they, used, they sang quite regularly a song that only appeared in the BBC handbook. I don't know if you know it, Alan. I sing a song of the saints of God. I sing a song of the saints of God, patient and brave and true, who toiled and fought and lived and died for the Lord they loved and knew. One was a doctor, one was a queen, one a shepherdess on the green. They were all of them saints of God, and I mean to be one too. And now there's a moment that I mean to be one too. And then we that just to come. And it says they live not only in times past, but there are hundreds of thousands still. The world is bright with the joyous saints who love to do Jesus well. You can meet them in school or in street. It's out in school, on the street, in the store, in the church, by the sea, in the house next door. They are saints of God, whether rich or poor, and I mean to be one too. So the saints. But sometimes I think we can blow up the saints and uh, because they're able to do wonderful things, but we have the, to avoid the danger of elevating them into high status that we think of them as faultless. Because James in his letter speaks of the wonderful prayers of Elijah and he says, now he says, Elijah was a man just as human as we are. And the Bible shows that saints and followers of the Lord have their faults and their failings. Peter denied the Lord. David got into terrible trouble over his uh, uh, um, ways with a, a, a woman who was not his wife. Elijah, he had been a powerhouse of prophetic word and miracle, turning the whole nation back to God. And his ministry had been a dramatic success on that Mount Carmel. At Elijah's word, somebody once put it this way, at Elijah's word, a king trembled, the rain stopped for three years, a jug of oil never ran dry, a boy was raised from dead, fire fell from the sky, revival broke out, and hundreds of idolatrous prophets of Baal were false and executed. The dramatic contest was proposed by Elijah to the king after the three years of drought. He said, let's have a fair and square, a great sacrifice of Mount Carmel, but there of an altar, wood, and a sacrifice, and no fire. Let the God whom you pray to answer by fire. And of course, they agreed. And so it was. Elijah versus 450 prophets of Baal. What a drama on Mount Carmel. And the prophets of Baal started first, but there were many. And they 
started to pray to the God and the sacrifice was there but no fire. And all through the morning they shouted and Elijah mocked him, maybe he's gone here, yeah, God's gone to the toilet. Go on, shout loud. And, and so they did. They shouted, they slashed their, their, their wrists and their, their chest with their, in their, their shouts. But no matter how frantic they were, nothing happened. And then Elijah just came and he put 12 stones for the altar, put the wood on it, and the sacrifice. And he said, Let there be no doubt about this. And he says, Bring a large bath of water, pour it on it. And he said, Do another one, and do a third one. And so the whole thing was saturated. And then Elijah said a simple prayer Lord God, show them, these are the people that I have acted in your command. Send the fire from heaven. That was all. And the fire came. The Lord's power, the fire from heaven consumed everything. And the people saw that God was living and his power was awesome. And the, all this was convinced. It was a spectacular victory. God was shown to be the living Lord. His power was absolute. His people must put him first. And not the empty gods of the, the, the nature because they were no gods at all. So what now? That's quite interesting. Well, at this time, the people needed clear leadership. They needed man, God's man along with other faithful leaders to consolidate the work, to counsel the doubters, to lead them back and teach them what the laws of God were and help them to return in true repentance and obedience. And where was the prophet? Well, he was 150 miles away to the south. He was away out of the land altogether. And he journeyed down beyond it, down to Sinai, to Mount Sinai. Why did he do that? Well, he was terrified for his life. He received a letter after that victory from the Queen herself. And the letter said, May the gods strike me down dead if by tomorrow I do not do to you what you have done to them. And the man collapsed. What's going on? Well, it's Today, we would say it's a classic case of burnout. Burnout. He had been keyed up during the drought, hiding from the followers of King Ahab, putting his life and his all into that spiritual battle on Mount Karma. He probably hadn't slept, he probably hadn't eaten. He had been buoyed up by his mission. He had been and even after the <coughs> sacrifice, he said to the king, Look, the rain is going to come and the drought has ended. And he ran ahead of King Ahab and, his, and he was going in his chariot. And he was running. He was so buoyed up. And now, as the first rain fell, <coughs> he's no energy left. He's exhausted. He's full of failure, full of foreboding. And a wicked queen's poison pen filling his mind. He's on his own, absolutely utterly on his own, no colleagues there. He has journeyed to Beersheba, the place for Abraham. He wished himself to be dead. He lay down under a juniper tree, fell asleep. And the wonderful thing is, an angel came. God knows all about him. And he said, Rise and eat. And he knew he was going to make this journey down. And so he ate and slept again. And he said, Look, here's another meal for you. And so he wishes himself. He's full of self-pity. He says he's served God, faith not by faithful Israel, and he even boasts, I am the only one left. But the wonderful thing is that God knows all about him, his poor servant. And the way to recover is not a place, not even my sign. The way to recovery 
is the heart and soul inside. Today, psychologists and psychiatrists remind us of the need for balance, of rest, and activity, for giving out and taking time to take in. Being in the thick of conflicts or thick of pressures, we all need to retire and see the big picture. Sometimes we get so worked up. I know that at one point in my ministry I was so busy with extra pastoral work, with mission planning, uh, with funerals and school assemblies, and then came Easter and we had a great run up to Easter. And on Easter Monday, Ian and I went up to Inverness where my parents were on the Monday. And when I got there, I couldn't do anything. I actually couldn't get out of my bed. And so, instead of having a week or two weeks off, they came back home. And I went to the doctor and I got this appointment. And my doctor was a straight talking guy. And he sat me down and he said, we went over the last few weeks, because he said, when did you stay off? Why did you have uh, um, the list? And he said, look, he said, just because you are doing God's work, don't imagine that you're superhuman, that you don't need time off, that you don't need rest or absent. He laid into me. And I still remember, and we got out of that talk. We all need time off. And this is what surely part of it is coming to lift our hearts up to the great God and Father and worship we find. In Matthew 14, I've already spoken twice of getting away to a place, a place far away from the crowds and getting the relationship with God. Whether it was in the hills or whether it was just out in that lonely place. His ministry had drained him when he was at the beck and call so much. And so he went away to his charge, and if he needed to do that, surely we do it all the more. Waiting on the Lord is not time wasted. Isaiah may tell us in chapter 14 that those who wait upon the Lord will find their strength renewed. They will rise up on wings like eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not grow weak. And so we come back to poor, <coughs> bumped out Elijah, running away and hiding in the cave on Mount Sinai. And God comes to him. <coughs> Elijah, what are you doing here? He doesn't answer the question of what is he doing. He just says, look, I've been zealous for you. Um, your people have been faithless. I only have done anything boasting. I only am left. Now God later on in the time said he had 7,000 who didn't bow the knee to Baal. What Elijah needed was a fresh baptism of God's presence to get back some of his inner strength to have his faith in you and not this awful fear of what Jezebel would say to him. And so he asked him to stand on the mountain. The mountain where, remember, Moses had the Ten Commandments given to him and there was fire and smoke on the mountain and the people were afraid and stood away at a distance. And so on the mountain, Elijah was asked to stand. A furious wind passed by no word from God. An earthquake shattered the rocks nearby. No word from God. Then a fire went up the place. And no word from God. And then there was a calm. And it says a soft whisper of a voice. And that's what God wants of us, the listening heart. He is speaking to us, and sometimes we're so busy we don't listen. We don't take it in. Now, as congregation, we've all been through, what I would say, is an exhausting uh, period of presbytery planning. I think you would agree with us in this. 
So many of the buildings have to be sold, so few ministers are going to be serving the parishes. It all seems to signal failure. And we're at a low end, they're often spiritually at, at this time. And we need to know that God is not in the multitude of meetings and plans and activities. He's here. He does not give up on us. He's with us one to one. And at the end of the chapter, God deals kindly with this exhausted servant. But he's told, hey, go back. No quitting the ministry of the Lord. He's told to go back. He's not going to die in a cave. Secondly, he is told he has further ministry to do. I'm going to ask you to anoint three people. A new king, Hazael of Syria. A new king of Israel, Jehu, who actually became the army commander because there was a king on the throne, Jehu. And a new prophet successor, Elisha. You see, God has plans for his people. And God has plans for his church, no matter how it looks on the, the, to the human point of view today. And secondly, we must not think that we are indispensable. I only am left. Sometimes ministers get into that mode too, that we think we are the leaders. We're not the only ones. Far from being a lone voice, God has his people. And we all need to step in and listen to God leading us. And not limit Christian work to our limited insight, our limited powers. We have to enlist others, new folk coming up, and into his, uh, to serve in his kingdom. So God meets us one to one, you and me, I. He meets us often in stillness when we're ready look up. And he tells us that we are dearly loved, deeply loved, and we are supported throughout our life by a God and a Savior who can still every storm in our life. And he is able to work and as Paul says, and he says this too, that he is able to work all things for our good. And we don't know how that is when we've got troubles that we may have or you have things that are going on in your life today. We don't know how, but God saves you well. He uses even troubles to strengthen us. And he will lead us into new paths of service. So be still and know that God is with us. And he is the one who blesses all who trust in him. So remember, dear friend, keep trusting. And he is with you. Don't worry about the outlook that is bleak. Try the uplook, which is glorious. Amen. Thanks be to God for this word to us today. And so we make our offerings and our prayers.
And we offer our prayers. Thank you, Lord, that you give to us. Every day you are giving rich in blessings and in insight and leading us. We ask you to bless these gifts. And may you bless gifts and givers and use them in ways that bless your name. Amen. And we offer our prayers for others too. Lord, before the world began, you have seen us and loved us. You created me before even you created us. You were faithful and planned all things for good. And we, your people, are thankful. Thankful for your abiding, unconquerable love. Shown again and again down through the ages, you have never abandoned your people, even when they may have forgotten or misrepresented. We, faith, we praise you, faithful God, for the steadfast love that has inspired us, the promises that we receive that have never faltered, and the light that has guided us on our way. We pray for all now who are under stress, those who feel depleted or depressed, and especially those who feel they failed in their work and who are full of doubts and questions. <coughs> Lord, draw them into your peace. We pray for all who fear the future because of perhaps physical illness or spiritual emptiness. And we remember in our prayers the people of our congregation like Teresa Taylor and Sheila Duncan, Archie Steele and Alec Tweedy, Mae White and Mae Baird, Sylvia, Thora Davidson and Emma Smith. We pray for all those and young, our young adults who are turning to the schools and colleges at this time. Lord, draw us into your peace. And we pray for the power of your gospel to be abroad in your people. No matter what the places are, we thank you that you are at work throughout our world. Your spirit's power has not lost its energy. Our Lord's grace has not failed. The jars of our life are not running and empty when the Lord is with us. And so we pause to remember all the members we know, our own family members, our neighbours in the street, our work colleagues, fellow church members. Lord, we pray for us all. And we ask you to guide us, help us and renew us. Lord, we pray this in your great and glorious name. Amen. And here's a hymn, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. And again it speaks of the peace coming and listen. Dear Lord.
may the love of our Father in heaven unfold us. The love of our Savior calm our fears. And the love of the Spirit recommission us in his service.